we're going to start our journey on mechanics and we're going to start with Newton's laws of motion, but Newton's laws of motion as they originally appeared. Corpus omni persevere in <laughs> Statue Sua. See, our Latin students just laughing at me now. Yeah, you don't say it that way. All right, there's our translation. So, everybody continues in a state of rest or in uniform motion in a right line, that just means it's travelling straight, unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. And that basically just means you're going to move with a constant velocity unless some force is applied to you. And that's all that really means. The second law is probably the more famous of them all, as you would recognise. Yeah. Motus proportionalim. Mm -hmm. Which is basically saying this. The change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which it is impressed. So what are they saying? The motive force is proportional to the change in motion. Well, change in motion, change in velocity, that's acceleration. So force is proportional to acceleration. And when something is directly proportional, we say it's equal to a constant times the acceleration. And that constant turns out to be mass. And so the famous force equals mass times acceleration. Ah, uh, the third one, actioni contrarium. <laughs> I, I think it's most often paraphrased as to every action is an equal and opposite reaction, but this is actually what it says. So to every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction or the mutual action of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed in contrary parts. That's the one that's basically saying why I'm not falling through the ground right now. So gravity, yes, is the force due to gravity is acting on me, but there is an equal force with the floor acting above. So it balances out. Okay. So we're interested in forces. So vectors and forces, well, forces are vectors. Okay. Because force was equal to mass times acceleration. And acceleration can be drawn as a vector like we did with uh, projectile motion. Remember we started with the acceleration in projectile motion and worked our way down and got to the displacement equation. But we want to make life easy for ourselves. Again, I'll refer back to projectile motion. Projectile motion was in two dimensions. It is a heck of a lot easier to look at things in one dimension. So just straight line motion. And so we resolved it into horizontal and vertical parts. And we'll do the same here when we have to. So any force that's not vertical or horizontal, we'll resolve them that way. And then it'll end up, the original force will be the hypotenuse of a, a right angle triangle. There we go. Something like this, where we've got two forces acting on this object. We want to find the resultant force, the result of all of these forces added together, as shown in this particular diagram. Now, two ways of doing it. I could say, all right, well that, if I was to add these two vectors together, there's the first one, three newtons, but then I'd add the second one of five newtons. So the resultant would end up being that red line that I've drawn in there. If I look at that a bit closer, I can work out through geometry that that angle there has to be 135 degrees. I want to find, well, it's actually not that angle I want to find, it's to the horizontal I want to find. And so it will end up being 60 minus theta. But I label that one theta because it's going to be easier to find the angle inside that triangle. Sine rule, sine theta on 5 will be sine 135 over that uh, resultant force. As so sine theta is 5 sine 135 over the resultant force. So it probably would have been good to find the resultant force first, wouldn't it? Trust me, it turns out to be 28 degrees 41 because the resultant force, there we go, he <laughs> should have done that first. We'd be using the cosine rule. 3 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 3 times 5. Cosine 135. Yeah, around about 7.43. So we have the magnitude of the vector and we have the direction. But it's easier to think of it with horizontal and vertical. Personally, I think it is anyway. So each one of these vectors can be redrawn 
there's the three newton one with a vertical component and a horizontal component. So the original force is the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. And I can do that with the other one as well. So instead of drawing the forces with these two green lines, I can say, well, I've got a vertical one that would end up being three sine 60. And there's another vertical one, five sine 15. There's a horizontal one that would be three cos 60 and another horizontal one, five cos 15. Putting it all together, I'm saying, well, my resultant vector or resultant force would be the horizontal components, three cos 60 plus five cos 15 in the horizontal direction, so times I, and in the vertical direction, three sine 60 plus five sine 15 J. And uh, well, to our calculations, there's the numbers we get. So if I now just draw a right angle triangle, I know horizontally, I'm gonna have 6.3296, vertically 3.8922, bit of Pythagoras, we get the same answer, thank goodness, 7.43, and a bit of trig, we get the same angle, 32.59. So we tend to break them into horizontal and vertical. So what types of forces are there? Okay. We're going to be interested in resistance forces. So whenever you, we move, we're going to get some sort of resistance. If I'm just walking here, there will be some air resistance. Probably not a lot, but if I was in the water swimming, then I'd have some resistance with the water. There's always going to be some sort of resistance, and resistance is always directed in the opposite direction to which you're moving. Okay. Now, it turns out that uh, it's going to be usually proportional to some power of the velocity. Okay. The quicker you move, the more resistance is going to be against you. So you usually see V or V squared. It'll be a constant times that because it's proportional to the velocity. So you usually find the resistive force is KV or KV squared, something like that. Uh, another common one is the gravitational force, also known as weight. And so that's the force due to gravity, mg. Now, forces in pairs. Let's go back to that third law I was talking about. If object A exerts a force on object B, then B exerts a force on A as well. They're usually, they're in pairs. They'll have the same magnitude, but they'll be in opposite directions. Normal contact forces. So that's the one I was talking about when I'm standing on the ground here. Uh, so anytime an object's in contact with a surface, there'll be a force on the object going away from the surface. That's called the normal contact force, sometimes simply just called the normal force. Frictional forces also come with the surface as well. Now, frictional force is effectively, it's just a, a resistive force. This one is proportional to the normal force. So you usually find the frictional forces will equal some constant times the, the normal force. Tension forces. So when objects are attached to strings or chains or things like that. Now, those forces will go in the direction of the will go in the direction of the, the string, but away from the object. Away from the object. So that's what we call tension. In our problems, positive does not have to be up. It does not have to be to the to the right. It can be any direction you like. You can make any direction positive you want. Usually we say, well, the direction we're moving in, we'll, we'll make that positive. And so therefore resistance ends up being negative. Diagrams, I don't know how people try and do these without them. So you draw your diagram of forces so you can get a feel for what's happening. So okay, we've got a box, 32 kilograms. It has a handle on one side and two people are trying to move it across the floor. One is pulling it horizontally on the handle and they can apply a force of 20 newtons. The other pushes from the other side with a force of 29, but the box won't move to draw all the forces. Okay, there's good old Bob. It's always call cool, that Bob. So what have we got? Someone's pulling it with a force of 20. So for my diagram, I'm saying we're, we're gonna be moving in that direction. 
But someone's also pushing it with a force of 25. That's also in that direction. So we have those forces. But it's not moving. So something is resisting that. It's stopping it from moving. Most probably friction on the ground there. So there's another force. I've called it friction. You could just call it a resistive force. I mean, but something is stopping it from moving. There are more forces there because there is a force due to gravity. Right? But there would be opposed to that the normal contact force because it's on the ground. So actually there are five forces there I could, I could put in. Now if I want to find the frictional force, I don't need to use all of them because friction is purely horizontal here. So the vertical forces aren't going to make a scrap of difference. It's all going to come down to the uh, one that I've labelled F3. So I'm interested in the resultant force here. Now the resultant force you don't draw on your force diagram because it's the result of all the forces. It'll be in the direction in which we're moving. So I'm saying that resultant force will end up equaling force 1 plus force 2 but minus force 3. It's in the opposite direction. But the other thing I know is the resultant force is zero because it's not moving. So zero must be 20 plus 25 minus F3. So we can work out the frictional force for this one is, is 45. So we have two trucks, a 30 kilogram and a 50 kilogram truck. They're joined together. Uh, truck on the right's pulled along with a force of 120 newtons. We're assuming there's no friction in this problem. We're going to calculate the tension. Now, Yes, there would be some vertical forces in this one, but you'll note we haven't bothered putting them in the diagram because they're not going to affect the problem. Again, we're talking about something that's purely horizontal here. All right, well, I look at each of the individual systems. So there's a truck on the left. What's happening with the one on the left? Okay, I know I have tension going to the right. Uh, that's all I've got because we're neglecting any frictional forces or anything like that. So the resultant force of my truck is simply the tension. It's the only force. We know the mass of our truck is 30. So that force, mass times acceleration, I'm saying is 30A. And that's, that'll equal the tension. So I could come up with an expression for the acceleration of the truck. Uh, T on 30, whatever the tension is on 30. Now let's have a look at our right-hand truck. It also has tension. Now that value has to be the same because it's just one well, piece of chain they've caught it, haven't they? So there's one piece of chain. You can't have different tensions, otherwise the chain would be slack and it, it wouldn't have any effect on it at all. So it's got to be the same tension. But this time it's going to the left. And we've also got 120 going to the right. So the resultant force, yes, I know in your head you're thinking Y is vertical. It's just a pronumeral I'm using, okay? Because it's going to have a, a difference, possibly, acceleration to the other one. So we're saying MY double dot is 120 minus T. But in this case, the force will be different. The acceleration actually will turn out to be the same, of course, because, again, if the acceleration of one truck was different to the other one, well, one would bump into the other or, or something like that. So 50A will be 120 minus T. We're trying to find T, but I can sub in what we worked out for A in the, the left-hand side. Sub that in, make T the subject, we get our tension. We have a mass of two kilos resting on a smooth plane. Okay. Draw a diagram of the problem. Okay. There's the problem. I haven't put any forces on it yet, though. So we have some sort of pulley system there, a two kilogram and a four kilogram. So what are all the forces happening on this one? This two kilogram object is in contact with this. So there will be a normal force, but it's at right angles to the surface. So it's going off in that direction. It will have a force due to gravity, but it's going down. It's still going down. Doesn't matter that the object's at an angle, gravity's always going down. On our other object, we'll have 4g, so mg, mass times gravity, going down. But we're also going to have tension in our, uh, our string there. Again, it's the same piece of string, so it's got to have the same value, so tension. But both of them are going away from the object. So there's a diagram of all our forces. We're going to find the tension if that block then starts moving down. So let's have a look at the vertical forces 
on the four kilogram mass. I had 4G going down, tension going up. So I've called this the resultant of the four kilograms. That's what R4 is standing for. The resultant force of all those would be 4G minus T, uh, T for tension. I've made the resultant force the direction down being the direction because it's saying if the block is moving down. So let's move down. So four times some acceleration is 4G minus T. Now let's have a look at the two kilogram mass. There were the forces. Now whilst I said we normally resolve horizontally and vertically, I'm actually going to do a little trick here. Now I'm not going to do that. I'm going to resolve in the direction of the plane that it was sitting on. The reason I've done that is because I want to work out T. T is at right angles to that F1. So it's like our problems before when they were sitting horizontally, those vertical forces didn't matter because it didn't come into play. So if I think of it the same way, you can think of another way you can think about, oh, well, let's imagine we rotated the problem so that that tension was horizontal. And again, F1 would play no part in it. But I need to locate 30 degrees. And so forces, now it's not horizontal or vertically, I'm saying up the plane because that would be the direction that it wants to go. That'll be where the resultant force is going. So we'll have tension up. And then we'll have this 2G sine 30 going down. And that's all we'll have. So the resultant force on my 2 kilogram block is T minus 2G sine 30. And now we can sub in, well, it'll be the same acceleration because it's all the one system. T minus 2G sine 30. Subbing that in over on the left-hand side uh, for 4A, so doubling that, and we end up there it is, 4G, 1 plus sine 30. Sine 30 is a half, isn't it? Yes. So 19.6 newtons we end up getting. All right. So that was a lot of just talking about forces, but we need to talk about forces. Probably the more important thing at this stage is now talking about acceleration because force is equal to mass times acceleration. We're used to seeing uh, velocity and acceleration in terms of time at the moment. But it doesn't have to be in terms of time. If velocity was some function of x, so a function of the displacement, what happens is acceleration is actually the derivative of a half v squared with respect to x. So we don't just differentiate the velocity. We only do that if it's with respect to time. Let's prove it. We know acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So it's the V to T. Now that expression itself, that's fine. If we're dealing with time and we want to find something that links velocity and time together, the V to T works fantastic. Now I could rewrite that using our implicit differentiation chain rule, call it whatever you like. The V dx times dx to T. But hang on, dx to T is V. So we get the V dx times velocity. Now that is really handy. V to V dx. That's where we want to link velocity and displacement together. I'll keep going because that's not all we want to prove, but that line in itself is very useful. Now V, careful, watch this. I could rewrite velocity as the derivative of a half V squared with respect to V. Right? So if I said to you, differentiate a half V squared with respect to V, you'd get V. But now the V's cancel, and there's our d dx of a half V squared. And that's another formula that's sometimes used when you want to link uh, V and X. Personally, I tend to use the V to V dx one myself. So let's have a look at an example for that. So we know acceleration, there it is, in terms of X. We want to find its velocity. I'll do it two ways. First, using the ddx for half v squared. So we're saying ddx of half v squared, acceleration, is 3 minus 2x. So if I integrate both sides, I'll get 3x minus x squared plus a constant on the right-hand side. Sub in some initial conditions to work out the constant. Turns out the constant is zero for this one. I get v squared. Not quite what they want. I have an expression for v squared, they want an expression for velocity. But velocity will be plus or minus. 
So this brings up an interesting point. How can it have two velocities? Right, because remember, we've taken time out of this. So at any point in time, it can't have two velocities. But we're not talking about it. We're talking about it in terms of displacement. Now, it could be at the same position more than once. One time it might have a positive velocity, another time it might have a negative velocity. So it is possible for velocity to be plus or minus. Okay, I personally would prefer to do this with V to V dx. Uh, treat it like a differential equation, separate the variables, do it as a definite integral. Um, so what do we end up with? Integral of V to V, integral of 3 minus 2x, matching up the initial conditions, 1 and 2. We want to link x and velocity. And you'll notice what happens on the left-hand side of this, because if I now integrate V to V, what do I get? Half V squared. So there's the half V squared from over here. So it brings out the half V squared anyway. Um, but now I've got it as a definite integral. I just think that makes life a little bit easier. So we get half V squared minus 2 is 3x minus x squared minus 2. And again, we get V squared is 6x minus 2x squared. Now, that equation can tell me a lot straight away. Because V squared, well, it's got to be a positive number, V squared. So I know 6x minus 2x squared is greater than or equal to 0. If I factorise that and solve that inequality, it tells me about the particle now. Because we know that x is in between 0 and 3. So it doesn't have a great life, this little particle. It travels between 0 and 3 and that's all it does. That's its life. Acceleration, this time 3x squared. Particle initially 1 to the right. We want to find, we want to bring time into this. So the problem doesn't have any uh, time in the original question, but we want to bring it into the problem. So again, I'm going to use the VDX for, V to VDX for acceleration. So V to VDX is 3X squared. Now, they've told me when X is 1, velocity is minus root 2. So let's integrate, and eventually doing our subbing in, I've got V squared is 2X cubed. So V we now know is plus or minus a square root of 2x cubed. I want to get a link between displacement and time. Velocity is dx to t. But notice I have not got plus or minus. I've only got minus. I had to make a decision. Is it plus or is it minus? Now that decision is based upon the initial conditions that I'm using to solve this problem. When x is 1, velocity is minus root 2. So therefore, when I sub x equals 1 into this, I have to end up with minus root 2. So that's why I've chosen minus root 2 to keep going with the problem. It needs to satisfy those initial conditions. Okay, well, let's oh, put it into index form so I can do some integration. Again, separate out the variables. Now, we know somewhere... Oh, there it was, initially. So time is zero, displacement is one. We want to find this link between displacement and time. So we end up with, well, close. We've got t in terms of x. We want x in terms of t. So I've got to make x the subject of all this. So let's keep going. t plus root 2 is the square root of 2 over x. Almost there, turn them upside down, and we got it. There's an equation. So displacement is 2 over t plus root 2, all squared. Now, you'll notice this HSC question is extension 1, and we're dealing with an extension 2 topic. That's because, in the old course, this used to be an extension 1. Yeah, but they've moved it into extension 2. We want to show that our velocity is given by x squared plus 1. It's all right. V to V X is 2X cubed plus 2X. Separate them out. And match up the conditions. And eventually, there's V squared. Ah, but hang on. X to the 4 plus 2X squared plus 1. That's a perfect square. So V squared is X squared plus 1 squared. Now, had I just written V equals X squared plus 1, I probably would have lost a mark. Because it's saying show that. Well, hang on a second. Shouldn't it be plus or minus? 
why did you choose plus? So you would need to make some sort of note why I chose velocity to be positive rather than negative. So again, I'm matching up the initial conditions that they gave me so that it would work. Hence, <coughs> it's actually a very similar question to the last one we did. Hence, go and find the expression for x in terms of t. So now I make it dx to t, integrate. Ooh, this one's a little bit more interesting. T is the inverse tan of x. Now that's t in terms of x. We want x in terms of t. So inverse tan x, tan both sides. Ah, you'd probably get away with that for a solution. But tan plus tan on one minus tan tan. That looks so much nicer. <laughs> 6a, playing around with that.